بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته this is your host Gabriel Romani and welcome to another episode of Defense Against Disaster where we teach you بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى by the will of Allah how to defend yourself against intellectual apostasy today we're going to continue with the history we said that the attacks on Islam today are various there was a paradigm shift with Darwinism the advent of atheism agnostics, uh, many, many different ideas and ideologies now, and a lot of them are in an intellectual war with Islam. Because Islam is threatening, okay? Islam calls people towards moral justice, calls people towards spiritual justice, calls people towards leaving evil and embracing goodness and truth. It means that all the businesses and all the things that are built today upon the foundation of cheating, lying, deceiving, haram, evil, pornography, gambling, all these things which a lot of countries thrive on are threatened by Islam. For them it's a default, it's okay, it's, it's morally acceptable. But see, Islam says no. So people are threatened, be it on a greater scale or on an individual scale. If we look into the history, the early Catholic Church, you'll find, you'll find that a lot of accusations took place from that towards Islam. A lot of the misconceptions rose from people in the early Catholic Church talking about Islam, writing about Islam. Some of the priests, some of the holy men who wrote about Islam and distorted information. Going even earlier, going even earlier, if we look at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and look at this, this is something amazing. Some of the non-Muslims came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, it says in the Quran, so and so. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. And then he explained to them. There was a misconception. Till today, that misconception is still alive because people are not willing to accept even though it was explained to them, even though it was told them, they do not want to because they don't care about finding out the truth. They want to spread as much as, or as many misconceptions as they can to flood. That's one technique that missionaries and people who want to attack Islam do. They want to flood the arena with arguments. So because there's so many arguments, you already start getting confused and you think, okay, well, it must be true because so many people are saying it. There's so many issues. There's such a big list. Oh my God, I never knew about these things. And you get confused, which is totally, totally deceiving. It's a deceptive and deceiving technique. So we find that the Reformation also created a paradigm shift because now you find that some of the greatest people who are attacking Islam are what's called these born again. Okay, born again people have organized around the attacks of Islam, especially in the United States and European countries who have, as we said at the beginning, a huge budget, a very fat budget that basically is directed towards attacking Islam. Intellectually confusing people, intellectually giving dawah from their side and trying to convert the Muslims to their understanding. If we look at, again, other examples, um, the case of Thomas Carlyle, Heroes and Hero Worship. Okay, the book that he wrote. If you look at Dante's Inferno, if you look at the translation of the Quran, I want you to do some research, okay? Take these names. Okay, I want you to research Thomas Carlyle, C-A-R-L-Y-L-E, Heroes and Hero Worship, that's the name of the book. I want you to look into the Dante's Inferno, it's a book, and what he wrote about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I want you to look into the a translation of the Quran and its history and see how deceptive this was and how they translated the word God into the European language to mean something as an idol. So when you read it, when it says, Qul Allahu ad, say God is one, it will say something like, say the idol is one, you know. So basically the connotation, the understanding of anyone who would read it would be like that this is a book of paganism or of idol worship. Because picking one word, and as they say, a translator can be an assassin. 
or a killer. Right? Because if he translates one word incorrect, he can change the whole meaning. And because of that, he can change public opinion. And when public opinions change, hatred starts showing. And when hatred is there, wars start. And when wars start, people die. From one word it can happen. Changing one opinion. The popular opinion. The culture of a country. And then this is what happens. Look at the riots that took place. How many people died in history? Why? It was always because some smart guy thought that he can say something and people just followed. They just believed. He changed a few things here and there. Lied. And then all hell broke loose. Try to check the translation of Quran and see how people, how deceptive they were and how long it took for the Muslims to regain and to translate that thing properly. Translation of Quran was done by non-Muslims first. For what purpose? For the purpose of finding Islam. I remember when I took my first copy of the Quran in the Romanian language and the introduction or the author's note was full of hatred. And one of the things he said that the purpose of translating this book is for us to be able to fight this Islam that brought so much damage to the church, which is totally something totally incorrect. If we look at Orientalism, Orientalism, the science, the branch of study of usually Westerners who study Eastern religions. So you find Orientalists who study Islam, Orientalists who study Hinduism, Orientalists who study Buddhism, and wrote about it. But a lot of them were usually associated with missionary activities. So you have Montgomery Watt, Sir William Muir, and many others who understood the Quran, who studied Arabic, who wrote. But when they would write, they would write, of course, through their lens, their own experiences. A lot of them would write of Islam and of the Arabs as something very exotic, okay? You have 1,001 nights, Arabian nights, exotic, right? Belly dancers and flying carpets and, you know, concubines and all these things, slaves, right? That's what they would try to bring out. It's a very carnal type of religion with a lot of, you know, references to sex and so on, so that they would discredit this and then compare it to the spirituality and the monk type of life and worship of other religions, right? So Orientalism developed until today. It is a science that's quite, you know, antagonistic to Islam and quite, you know, damaging to the Muslim Ummah because a lot of these people sometimes are considered as scholars for Islam. So you have someone who doesn't understand the principles of Aqidah and Islam. They study Islam from their own perspective. And then they try to cast doubts on it. And including hadith and fiqh. And then you'll find a huge amount of work that's been done. And it's been for hundreds of years this science has existed. So... When Muslims get faced with that, they, they don't understand. They get confused. But a person with knowledge, again, will be able to fight this off. I remember, interesting, that there was one orientalist that he was sitting up in Egypt on a balcony at night, listening to the old sheikh reciting the Quran. And this is just to show how, you know, they're fighting the urge of the truth. Because, see, they understood Arabic. They studied Arabic. And he said that the Qur'an was captivating me and pulling me. Yet I knew what my mission was or, you know, like he was fighting it, you know. But a lot of these people knew and understood. A lot of the people, if we look at Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, right? They would hear the Qur'an, they would understand that this is the truth. Yet still, they would fight against it. They would go at night and listen to the Qur'an. And they would catch each other. Why would they listen to the Qur'an? Because it brought peace to them. They were mesmerized by the words. Yet when they would catch each other, they would feel ashamed. How come? Oh, you came here. Oh, you look. What, do you believe in this? And their arrogance and pride would not allow them to embrace the truth. And then in the morning, they would fight against it. 
They would go against it. And at night, they would return back again. That is what happens to the Orientalists as well. We're going to take a short break, inshallah, and we'll be right back after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Uh, defense against disaster. This is unprecedented, alhamdulillah. Jazakum khair. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you're taking notes. I hope that you are benefiting from this. I promise you that this is going to be worthwhile. And by the end of this course, you'll be able to, inshallah, take this knowledge to other people in your community and protect your community, your family, from intellectual apostasy. Leaving Islam. We're talking about the different uh, aspects, the different angles from which Islam is attacked. We'll continue with, uh, today with the issues also of uh, crusaders. See, crusaders, when the, the, the Muslim Ummah was attacked from that side, the public opinion had to be gained. So you don't think right now that in the 21st century, you know, all these issues of terrorism and extremism that you see on TV, that this is something new. Oh my God, no. This was what happened before as well. And they used to say that if you kill a Muslim at that time, the Crusaders, that this will be a path for you into paradise. Or that you will be forgiven some of the sins. So they used to have, for example, if you drank a lot of alcohol, you're alcoholic, you know, you have to kill this many Muslims to be expiated. And if you committed murder, you have to kill this many Muslims to be expiated. And if you've done incest or adultery, you have to do, kill this many Muslims to be expiated. And many others. Again, what was that? It was to change public opinion and to direct hatred towards the people. With that, you have a license now to, sadly, to kill. And this is something not, that's not new. You know, this is what happened when the lands of uh, America were taken over with the Native Americans. You know, the way the people demonized and dehumanized the First Nations, the natives, it was just the same type of attack. Because when you're not dealing with humans anymore, supposedly, then it's easy for you to just take it up to you and just take their lives. Colonization was another thing we talked about. Uh, political aspirations from a lot of people that you know, were pushed against Islam. Modernization, liberalism, people becoming very liberal. Philosophy, that's another huge thing that really affected the Dao of Islam. Okay, because you have to understand, philosophy is a human science. It's made by human beings. And logic as well. A lot of times people confuse logic and philosophy for rationale and reason. And reason and rationale require proofs and evidences. Logic and philosophy have their own foundation, which again are human-made, right? So the premise is usually made by the same science. So you have to be very careful, especially I've met so many Muslims who, you know, go to university and take philosophy courses and so on and then get confused and then they leave Islam. Silly arguments. And they get confused. Arguments such as, if God is so powerful, can he make a rock so big that he cannot lift? So people start thinking, thinking, thinking. Right? Because the premise is wrong. The premise is wrong. The question is not proper. It's not formulated properly. People get confused. They say, oh, wow, yeah, that's true. Right? This is, it's a setup question. Okay? If God is so powerful, can he make something so big that he cannot lift? No. Because you're affirming a character and denying one. Okay? God is all-powerful, therefore he can make whatever he wants. And the second part of the statement is invalid. So you see, but people don't think about it. They get caught and cornered in a certain way, in a certain corner, dictated by their premise. And this brought so much damage, even it affected Islamic thought. Let us move now. And this is where you really need to pay a lot of attention, brothers and sisters. And that is, we want to give you some general techniques that people use. These are techniques that, doesn't, it's, you know, irregardless of religion or philosophy or whatever it is, but 
In general, we come up with these techniques that people, when they try to attack Islam, this is what they do. Number one, I hope you're ready. Number one is taking a single ayah or hadith in isolation from the rest of the Islamic rubric, the rest of the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay? So people come and say, ah, this is what it means. For example, you know, in Surah Tawbah, when Allah says in the Quran to fight them and to kill them, right? People say, ah, see, this is what Islam says. No, this was dealing with a battle. Of course, what do you think they're going to say at a battle? Here has some, some chai together, some tea or something, some biscuits, some pizza. No, it's fighting. Okay, it's a battle. If you go to a boxing match, what are you going to tell? If you're a coach, what are you going to tell the fighter? Uh, you're going to say uh, dance? No, you say box, fight. Right? But see, people take it out and they say, ah, see, this is what Islam is about. This is what Islam teaches you. No. See, they're taking things out of context. They don't read before and after. They don't read the whole thing. They just quote, you know, Surah 9, verse this. And this is a big disservice, a big lie. And it is something that is probably the number one technique that people use, trying to take things out of context. And it can be done for everything and anyone. But it seems that Islam is always under the scrutiny of people. And all it takes for someone is to, look, when someone attacks you and says, look, oh, this hadith or this ayah, all you have to do is just go a few verses up and a few verses down. Put it in context and see what it is all about. Understand also that Islam is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the sunnah of the Prophet See, previous nations who had the previous books were given the books, but the sunnah, the implementation died off or was not there, the sunnah. See, for the Prophet Sallallahu because this is the last message, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has protected the Qur'an through the memorization of people, but not just the verses, but also their interpretation, their application through the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So whenever someone comes and takes something and says, look at this hadith, look at this ayah, you say, wait a second, with all due respect, let me see. And then you read. So many times, people take it out of context. So many times, People look and you find that if you read a little bit above and a little bit below, it's very clear what it refers to. See, when you don't have a full picture of what's happening, it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to jump to conclusions. For example, imagine that you walk on the street and you see an old lady on the street, on the floor. There's a dog next to her. And there's two youth who are running away. So you ask what happened, and you find that the lady says, Ah, oh, these youth attacked me, attacked me, they wanted to steal my purse. And then obviously, what are you going to do? Your natural inclination is going to, you're going to feel very sorry for this old lady. Right? Because she's an old lady, you know, look at these youth, you know, you know, these boys, and they're always causing troubles. Then, to discover only later on, when you check the surveillance camera that was on a pole close to the scene, that actually the woman was walking a dog and she passed by these two youth who were sitting on a bench and that the woman let the dog loose on them just like that, out of nowhere. So you see, because you didn't have the whole picture, you jumped into conclusion. Things were out of context and you made the wrong decision and you made the wrong assumption. We need to think about this because most of the problems that we have in Islam today or the attacks or the causes of people leaving Islam and people being confused are because of this. Because people do not understand the whole context. People don't know. And those people who are attacking Islam, they are experts at removing things out of context. Number two, ignoring the fact that not all the ahadith are authentic. In fact, some are termed weak and some are even fabricated. This is something very important. Right? Because people come and say, ah, look, the hadith says this. And they don't care that it's sahih, it's hasan, da'if. No, they don't care. They just say this is what it is. And this is, again, back to having knowledge. If people don't know, don't have the basics of Islam, it's very easy to trick them. So pay attention. The first thing you should do is ask, well, what is this? Is this authentic? Is this knowledge authentic? And they'll say, what is that? Right? You find that most of these people could care less about authenticity. 
whatever serves their purpose, they will use it. So brothers and sisters, it's very important that you know at least the basics of what's authentic and what's not authentic. Because these people, they love, they love to go into this because they know very well that you do not know. It doesn't take that long for someone to understand at least basic principles. No one's asking you to be a muhaddith, but to understand basic principles of what is authentic and what is not. Another thing is being very selective in what translation someone uses. This is funny, right? And not just that, being very, citing sources that are not there. So again, when you receive a source, they say, ah, Quran so-and-so, this verse, this verse, or hadith so-and-so from this book. Check, make sure that it's there. A lot of times, these things do not exist. The reference is wrong. It's not there. The hadith itself is not there. But these people just, you know, cut something and say, this is hadith, right? So be careful. Number one, again, I said, making sure that things are not in isolation, okay? Or out of context, sorry. Making sure that the hadith is authentic and make sure that the actual reference is there. Another very important point is that taking things in isolation. So what happens is, for example, is that one hadith has part of the information. Another one adds a little bit more, maybe. Then there's another ayah that explains also. And another hadith that explains more. And subhanAllah, when you look in the books of hadith, you'll find that these hadith are together under a certain chapter, the book of something. And they're under a certain section. And they're all there. But these people will look for the one that fits their purpose and their argument, and they'll pull that one out and put it on to you and try to confuse you. So the first thing you want to do is, well, where is this in? Which book? Okay, let me go back to it. And then you find the list of hadith that are on the same context, in the same topic. And then you find more information, a little bit more, a little bit more. And now, all of a sudden, the piece of the puzzle come together. It's not as they were telling you. It's not as these missionaries were telling you. Now it starts making sense. You say, ah, wait a second. So it's not, oh, look, the hadith is clear. That's one hadith. But you find that another companion narrated that same hadith, maybe some different wording, and extra information that maybe the first companion didn't hear. And now it starts making sense. And never, brothers and sisters, did scholars ever rule or take anything based on only one thing here or there. Okay, it was always, let's see what everything, what's the ayah saying, what's the hadith saying, what's everything saying. Then, this is called comprehensive knowledge. This is rational and reasonable instead of jumping the gun and, you know, causing problems. Anyway, we have run out of time again. Jazakumullah khair. I hope that you benefited. We will continue on another episode with these attacking techniques, general attacking techniques, and how to deal with them. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.